Chairperson of the Governance and Strategic Planning Committee. I'm going to pass over to Stephen for the notice summons the meeting and the roll call. Thank you, Chair. So, members, you hereby summons to attend the monthly meeting at Governance and Strategic Planning to be held in the Council Chamber Guildhall Derry at uh, 4 p.m. on the 4th of April. So, we we'll take the roll call. Alderman Cook? Here. Alderman Wilkinson? Here. Councillor Boggs? Apologies. Thank you. Councillor Donnelly? Councillor Duffy? Apologies. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Councillor Farrell? Here. Councillor Harkin? Here. Councillor Heaney? Sure. Councillor Jackson? I'm sure. Councillor McGinley? I'm sure. Councillor Mooney? Here. Councillor O'Farrell? I'm sure. And Councillor Tierney? Thank you, members. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so just for the broadcast statement, I would like to remind everyone here present at this meeting in the Guild Hall that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. The broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with our protocol. Due to your attendance at this meeting, your consent to be filmed and to the use and storage of those images for broadcasting and training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. Members and approved speakers are reminded they only have their mics and cameras on when speaking at the meeting and to use that doesn't apply anymore, does it? The chat was it. A copy of the Council's privacy notice is found on our Council website. So that moves us on to declarations of members and trusts. If anybody has anything to declare, you can do it now or at any stage throughout the meeting. Item five is our deputation, um, and we are receiving Fiona McGinn, the Future Schools Officer, and Sean Pettis, the Parental Engagement Campaign Manager, to advise members of the purpose and aims of the Future Schools Project. These are very welcome. Um, your presentation will be on the screen. We'll go through that, and then we'll open it up then for members' questions, comments, and that. So I'll pass over to yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, members, for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, as has been said, I'm Sean Pattis from the Integrated Education Fund, and I'm here with my colleague Fiona McGinn. Um, we're here not primarily to talk about integrated education today, but rather our future schools project. Um, you can move two slides on there. Can move. Can you click on just a couple more? Yeah. So um, the future schools project. Uh, it's been undertaken uh, as a partnership project between the School of Education in Ulster University uh, and ourselves in the Integrated Education Fund. And it's the aim behind it is really to involve uh, people and putting communities at the centre of decision making when it comes to education provision um, across Northern Ireland. Um, so for us in the IEF, it's about uh, a lot of how we gain our mandate is through parents and parental demand. So what we want to do is, is see what demand for all types of education are out there in different communities. Uh, and so this project is, is one way to do that. So my colleague Fiona is going to tell you a little bit more about why the, the project was developed. Could you move? Yeah. Slide on. Okay, hello everybody. So the Future Schools project has been designed to support schools and communities who wish to explore whether there might be a more sustainable approach to primary school provision in their local area. So well documented historical factors have led to the development of a system of education in Northern Ireland that on the whole reflects the enduring community division. So the situation means that many local areas may be served by two or sometimes even more than two primary schools. So according to the Department of Educational Sustainable Schools policy, there are too many schools across Northern Ireland and they have surplus places. So in 2020-21, there were 220 primary schools below the minimum thresholds. Um, 21 primary schools had fewer than 30 pupils. So school planning bodies are currently involved in an area planning process to create a network of sustainable schools. This has led to a number of recent school closures. So across Northern Ireland, the number of primary schools has fallen by 27 between 2019 and 2024. School planning bodies have been engaged with the Future Schools project as it aligns well with their direction of travel for area planning. So a study by Ulster University in 2019 examined the duplication of primary school provision in Northern Ireland. So this duplication typically occurs when a controlled school and a maintained school are located close to one another 
often in small settlements. So they identified 32 isolated pairs of primary schools, which were of different management types and located less than one mile apart and more than three miles from another similar school. In 20 of these pairs, one school was not sustainable and there were six cases where neither school in the pairing was sustainable. So the study concluded that were the schools to find arrangements to remove duplication and become more sustainable, they would be more likely to avoid closures, which would benefit the local communities and all backgrounds. So Ulster University is currently extending this research to include isolated pairs of post-primary schools. Thank you. Next slide, please. So in terms of the, the Future Schools project and how it can support communities, we kind of see it in three levels. Firstly, we're here to, to support communities who want to explore if there might be a more sustainable solution in their community or in their area. That can be driven by the school themselves, it can be driven by community members. Um, but the point is that it is about coming together to have some kind of engagement and some kind of conversation around uh, what school provision might look like in an area. Um, and the vision of it is not to predetermine an outcome. Um, it is to let communities decide for themselves what, what they think can best serve the local community that they're in. As Fiona stated, there's been a number of school closures over recent years. Um, and I guess the danger with that is that it can leave, you know, particularly rural communities vulnerable. Um, there may not be a type of school that's accessible to all children in the area. So this is about um, kind of having a preemptive conversation about what does education look like in an area? And if you can go to the next slide, please. One of the, the tools that we have, and we've got some with us in hard copy, it's available online. You're, we'll leave some just to the side of the room if you want to take one before you go, is the, the team at Ulster designed a, a Future Schools Toolkit. Um, and it, it comes in, in three sections. The first bit enables schools to kind of self-assess their own sustainability against um, DE's sustainability criteria. Uh, and to just think about where they are now uh, in terms of their numbers, their enrollment, their curriculum, um, all kinds of different aspects of the sustainability criteria. The second section uh, kind of outlines a, a methodology to have a community conversation about education provision in an area. Um, and that's by bringing together members, parents, school governors, school leaders um, from across a kind of geographic area to look at what is it we want, what is it we need in, in the community that we're in. Um, and the final section kind of outlines some of the pathways or processes that, that um, communities could take in, in terms of what their, their solution might look like in their area. So at present, we have some scope um, in partnership with Ulster. Ulster University can undertake some community conversations. If there's a community um, where there's an appetite for that, they can help facilitate that, um, that process. Um, and that is, of course, independently run by them. Um, as the IEF, our preference is for integrated education, but the process has no predetermined outcome. It has to be up to communities to decide what best they want. Um, but I guess there's a number of ways in which this links to other other policies that's going on. So my colleague Fiona will say a little bit more about that. So the Independent Review of Education in Northern Ireland was published in December. Um, there are very strong links with the Future School Project, so I'm just going to explain that. So there are a few highlights a concerning number of non-viable small schools, and it recommends a new approach to area planning. It recommends strict adherence to the minimum enrolment, so that's 105 in a rural school and 140 in an urban primary school. It recommends the establishment of an independent planning commission which will develop a plan for a new, a new network of schools based on sustainability and jointly managed schools. It suggests increasing the number of integrated schools or jointly managed community schools. And the new model suggests the creation of 99 new or reconfigured jointly managed community primary schools and 22 post-primary schools. So this would save money. The remodelling of this reconfiguration of schools suggests that running costs would reduce by £94 million per year. The review suggests that the Department of Education should encourage this change by allocating £1 billion of capital funding and £135 million over a period of 10 years for schools making the transition. So 
There's a number of things straight away. The, the Future Skills Primary Schools Toolkit is available. It's online. We've got some copies with us today. Um, that can be used really to focus on primary education. Um, Ulster University are also developing a post-primary schools toolkit, uh, which will be ready in September, so not too far away. Um, if you're interested in those, those we'll, we'll make the post-primary one available as soon as, it, as it's in, uh, published. Um, but the primary schools one's there and can be used as a resource potentially for schools in your areas that might be thinking about their own sustainability. If you think there might be an appetite for a community conversation where people are brought together to really think about um, provision in the area, please do get in touch with us because we can put you in touch with the Ulster University who can run some of these um, uh, uh, you know, for the, for the community. Um, so we've got some contact details there. Um, please do get in touch with us if uh, aspects of this are interesting to you or you want to know more, we're, we're here to help. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, both Fiona and Sean, for that presentation. Um, at this stage, I've got one indicated speaker. Um, I'm going to pass to Councillor O'Farrell to start with. And if any other member wishes to speak, please indicate and let me know. Uh, thanks very much for that presentation. Uh, I just want to know about Irish medium education. Did you factor that into uh, the, this uh, project you have? Uh, the other thing, uh, I'm from a, well, I live in a rural area at the minute. And all the rural primary schools, nursery schools are under severe pressure at the minute. Now, a lot of them are open for the integrated education, and uh, that's grand. But uh, you see, you mentioned communities and communities uh, driving these things. See, most people that I know in the rural communities, they want to keep their wee schools going. And, uh, you know, you are concerned about the numbers and figures and saving money and all the rest. But... Uh, as what see if the school collapses, the, the community itself will collapse, you know, because a lot of people go to areas because there's a school there, there's uh, infrastructure there, and I see it in the schools, but as well as that, do you see uh, people now in nursery schools and the smaller primary schools, see the nursery schools especially, the education authority are saying, this is the figure now, you can't take any more than this, you know. Uh, now, I, I'm totally opposed to that. I know it's, again, it's financial matters and uh, paying wages and all the rest. But um, no, um, uh, I'm glad you've factored uh, the education of uh, Irish medium education into it as well, because my sons, uh, both of them, the 30s now, but they went to an Irish medium uh, nursery school, primary school. See, when they went to primary school, my son was in a class, there were three in his class. And you see, if you're growing Irish medium education, you're going to start off small, you know, and it'll eventually grow. And uh, they went to Gale School, uh, uh, Gale School or Thraban, uh, uh, the Irish medium education school in Thraban, uh, Gale School Gockerty. Now, they have a brand new school now. Uh, now, my eldest son, when he was at school, there was three in the class. See, the, the younger boy he went to school two, two years later and him. The school started to grow. That school is doing really well. They're bursting at the seams now. So do you see uh, the size of the school, especially Irish medium education? Uh, we're going to start off small and maybe porter cabins or whatever. So I hope you are taking that into consideration as well, because there is going to be growth. Make no mistake about it. It's the fastest growing, uh, you know. So fast. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me, even, but thank you very much for your presentation. And I will be in contact with you, Gurumila uh, Mayogov. Thank you very much. Okay, Anton, I have one more question, just, and it was in relation to the recommendations around the strict adherence to the minimum enrolment thresholds, particularly in rural. And my, the DEA that I represent would be the MUR, and we've had threat of closure to Bullock Primary School, and this was part of the reason. And I'm just wondering, particularly in and around the rural schools, how do we recommend the strict adherence to that, where it could be the closure of, as Anton outlined there, what is essentially a community within a rural area? So I'm just just a wee bit of sort of background on, on why that's the recommendation would be appreciated. Um, so obviously the, we're coming at this from a, a non-governmental body, so the policy is not ours. I can, I can say a bit about it. I mean, the, a decision was made by the department off the back of the review of education in 2005 that the minimum size for primary schools should be 105 
and yeah, lots and lots of our primary schools were never set up to have that many children in them. And so it is a real issue um, when, you know, schools are in areas where they're just not going to be able to reach those numbers. I guess that's partly the rationale for the project, which is, you know, rather than having things done to communities, that the communities have a, 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 an opportunity to get together and think about what, what could provision look like in our area, um, no matter, you know, if it's Irish medium or primaries or CCMS or controlled schools, whatever, you know, whatever, um, whatever form or function it is. Um, the what's interesting is yes, the review and um, the recent review published in December has reiterated those numbers as being important. So I can't defend them or you know promote them. That that's what they've said rather than than us. Anyone else wish to speak? Alderman Cook, go ahead. I just want to um thank you on behalf of the DP as well. Um um, it is something, just going by what Anton was saying there, um, in regards to school closures, um, the state that I grew up in has quite a small primary school, quite small numbers, and it is scary for the community when there, when there is threats of closures, you know, um, but I just wanted to thank you very much and um, I really enjoyed that. Thanks. Very much at this stage, I don't have any other um, members wishing to speak on this. So Fiona and Sean, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on and you're welcome to stay for the meeting if you want to, but you didn't have to. <laughs> we'll carry on through. <laughs> Thanks very much. All right, folks, so we'll move forward. Um, item six is chairperson's business. I have three items under chair's business today. The first is myself, um, just to congratulate our Gaelic team, the Derry Gaelic team, um, who won the Division One League against Dublin on Easter Sunday. It was a fantastic match. I don't know if anybody else watched it, but I did. I was on the edge of my seat, but it was brilliant. And I would like to make a suggestion um, to the mayor's office. Um, coming from this meeting that um, there will be a reception for the, the dairy team to congratulate them on that achievement. Does anybody else wish to speak on that before I move on? Nope. Happy enough. Okay. Item two, Councillor Donnelly, you contacted me. Good morning, good chair. Uh, and it's just, I would I want to uh, make a request regarding item 14, Independent Plan Review, Dairy City Stepan District Council Planning Service. <laughs> Chair, the first thing that strikes me about this report is the emphasis that it puts on transparency and the need to, to reclaim uh, public trust. And here we are proposing that they discuss it in confidential. Uh, I don't think that that sends out the proper message. And I think that there's nothing in this report that can't be aired in public and that the public should be given the opportunity to provide input to the findings before the, the report is finalised. Therefore, I'd like to... Uh, they propose under chair's business that this item is brought in the open business. I'm Do you have a seconder for the proposal, Councillor Harkin? Are you looking to speak on it, or I'm going to pass it, Stephen? Very briefly. Um, yeah, I'm happy to second it. And look, again, uh, there's sometimes good reasons for an issue to be in confidential. I don't see any good reasons for this one to be in confidential. Um, it is uh, there is no jobs at the council. Uh, there's no discussion of uh, money, and I, I think that this is this would be one of the issues I think should be in in the public domain. So I, I support the proposal. Councillor Jackson. Yes, unless an officer wants to speak on the proposal, there's no. So it's over to the floor. No, and um, I suppose from our perspective, um, we. We tabled a motion um, calling for this review um, and took part on in quite a number of considerable works workshops with the authors of the report, um, as did many stakeholders, planning agents, environmentalist uh, uh, lobby groups, had all took part in a consultation in relation to this. The proposer and the seconder of the motion, to my knowledge, did not hand one of them. Um, and they're calling for transparency around the report. I think there does need to be, we, we have to have an element of 
of courtesy to all our people who took part in the process. Um, they inform them that we're bringing this into the, the public domain. They inform them um, that, because this, this, the, the process around this is that this is a public do document that's going to be once agreed by council, once agreed by all the partners, that this will be in the public domain. There is absolutely no transparency issues whatsoever. It's just the common courtesy of working with others, giving them the opportunity, giving them the notice. They say that well, we're uploading this document. You were part of it, um, and you no. Know, You've and, and given them prior notice rather than it being bounced um, from a proposal um, from the floor from two people who didn't take part in the process at all, um, to my knowledge. Um, so it just seems a bit strange that, um, that, that, that there's this sort of accusation that there's, there's something that's not transparent in this. The whole process was transparent. It was uh, the public dimension of engaging with key stakeholders, with agents, um, with people who regularly use the planet system. Um, they try and work a way forward that everybody can, uh, can be in agreement with. And from our perspective, we're not completely against, this is going to be a, this is a public document that will be in the public domain once um, ratified by council. Um, but I think we do need to have a wee bit of courtesy to all our people that took part in the process and they, they bounce it at a committee like this. Uh, it's, it's a wee bit disingenuous. The, the people who have been working with us, they suggest improvements. Um, and for that, for that reason, for that reason alone, um, we're not inclined to support the, the proposal. Um, we want to give the people that took part in the process, the due courtesy. We let them know that that this is the process. This is when it's going to become live. This is your opportunity, and, and give them a bit of notice in relation to it. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Tierney. Chair, sure, thank you. Um, I think I, there was a very valid reason at the time for this review to be carried out, and I think we're almost stretching under the to the realms of, of discussing it in public business before we have agreed or disagreed with the, the proposal from Councillor Donnelly. Um, and like Councillor Jackson has outlined, um, our members have also um, engaged fully um, in, in, in the process over this last um, 12 months um, or, or more possibly um, around the planning review, um, because I think it's important that you know, this isn't our planning system. It's the planning system of the people of Derry City and Strabane District Council area, um, and we have to make sure that it is efficient um, and that it is running correctly. Um, I have no issue. I'm not fixed either. We are not fixed either way um, on whether we discuss it now or we wait until full council. Um, but listening to, to Councillor Jackson's point um, around the, the transparency issues, I, I can understand and sympathise with it, um, but that would only really be I suppose valid if the stakeholders, the environmentalists, the planning agents, the developers were going to be furnished with the report in advance of full council. Otherwise, um, I, I don't see how that point stands because it will become a public document once, as Councillor Jackson said himself, it will become a public document once it is ratified by full council. Um, I would be keen to find out what the process is in that because I do understand and, and I accept that a lot of people um, put a lot of time um, and the uh, working with council officers and the and the um, planning consultants around this report, people from outside of this council who give up of their own free time and I do um, appreciate and I suppose in many ways sympathise with the, the courtesy element of it. Um, where, where where they might want to have a look at it again and, and, and feel as if they have signed off on the process along with council. Um, so I would like to know a, a little bit about the, the next stages of the process before we, 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 we commit to doing anything. I'm not going to get into whether people did or didn't attend the, the planning workshops. I think if you find it important um, enough, you'll, you'll make it your business to turn up um, and feed your views in. Um, I don't know whether people did or didn't. It's none of my business. I know that SDLP councillors were represented at it, and that's um, our job uh, as far as we're concerned. But I would have 
just a couple of questions for the officers around the process and the, and, and the next stages of the process before we, 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 we um, commit either which way to the proposal from Councillor Donnelly. Thank you. Okay, I'm happy to pass to Stephen to go through that. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So my understanding is once members have had a chance to discuss the, the report today, um, then it'll go forward to full council for ratification. That will then become a public document. So everybody who has contributed will be will be sent a copy. Um, we will take comments back from from all those contributors, and everybody will get a chance to see it. So it will become a public document at that stage. Um, obviously, the the normal process would be that we would debate these, and, and members would get a chance to debate them before they go into the public domain, which is why it's sitting there in confidential. However, it's a matter for members today whether they wish to debate it in public or whether they wish to leave it in the confidential, but it will be a public document post council and all the contributors will receive a copy of it and will be invited to, to make comments. Okay, is there any further comments? I know there's different views on the proposal, so we will have to go to a vote, but I want to give people the opportunity to comment if they wish. Councillor Anna. Very well, the Chair, and I have my reasons for not attend these type of exercises. I just don't have any confidence and and I uh I base that on experiences from including council officers over the years and reports. Uh I just don't have the confidence of them. But I think it's a wee but you know Councillor Jackson talks about accusations and courtesy. You know, we saw last week at, at, at full council how one party uh used confidential business to proclaim a witch hunt against planners. Uh and if they really believe that, you know it, least have the courage to say it in public the way that those raising planning concerns are prepared to do. There should be no skulking behind confidential business. And Chair, if this isn't, if people don't want to, I didn't hear a reason from the top table why it shouldn't be brought out. But if it isn't brought out, I do have an R proposal that will uh, liaise more closely with some of the groups uh, who, who contributed to it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Excuse me, Chair, just before you do, take a day of vote, if you yep. don't mind. I did ask a, a few yep. questions of officers, um, which they've kindly answered. Um, the, the flip side, I suppose, of that argument is that there are suggestions that um, this report was about openness and transparency and, and all of that. But I haven't heard from the proposers their rationale around a potential re reluctance of transparency or openness. And I wonder, through you, Chair, if you wouldn't mind if that opportunity would be afforded to the proposers to maybe outline where they see this process as outlined by officers not being transparent, if that makes sense. I'm happy to allow it if Councillor Danley or Councillor Adam wants to outline that. Well, I'm not sure I fully understand it, but it does say, you know, it, it, the emphasis on transparency is in page 102. The discussion in confidential is not transparent. And and we've had, you know, people in here can flip from from one minute uh, saying that working groups are good. And then when people propose a working group regarding other issues, then they're saying, well, it's behind closed doors and that's not what we want. Have a conversation in, 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 in the open. Let's have it. So you can't get any more transparent than that. There's no reason for the vote against this being brought out. Just before, oh, go ahead, Councillor Arkin. Look, in, in response to Councillor Tierney, I think that there is uh, part of the reason for this review is because uh, there's people are frustrated with the planning process and are frustrated in their eyes with the lack of transparency, transparency at times. And I've been contacted by people who, who know that this is on the agenda today and they're asking me, why is it in confidential? And I don't have a good reason for uh for it being in confidential i've been able to tell people at other times why a particular discussion may be it about uh councillors or sorry about uh jobs at the council and that would be a reason for not having it publicly discussed um but i i do know that people who contributed a lot to this discussion um have asked why is it in confidential today why is it not 
in public so we can actually see what's being discussed uh, and have an opinion on it. Um, so I don't. So that's my rationale for for uh, supporting the proposal to bring this into uh, public business um, as soon as possible, rather than delaying that. Councillor Jane, did you want back on? Not at that minute. If you don't mind, thank you, just Chair. Briefly, if you could, just so we can. No, absolutely. I, I will be brief. And, and I said when, when I spoke at the outset, um, I was in fact either way um, at the point, and I think the discussion has been good. Um, I want to make the, the point that, in my opinion, the, the suggested direction of travel, um, that this report wasn't confidential, um, and once ratified at full council, will be posted out and people will become aware of it, um, I think is transparent. Um, but I also um, don't want to give um, people an opportunity to say that we're trying to hide stuff or we're having this discussion behind closed doors or anything like that. Um, I think the report is the report. Um, whether it's discussed here at Open Business or whether it's posted out to people um, after full council, the report is the report. And I think the sooner that as a council that we get to working um, around the recommendations of that report, the better. And not having these suggestions as if there's stuff going on um, in, in, in the ether that nobody's allowed to know about, because that isn't my experience. And I think the sooner that people move away from that position, the better, and the more work that we can get done um, within this council. And on that basis, we're happy to have the discussion in open business, because I think the the sooner that we get to move on and the sooner that we get to support the planning system is the main outcome of this report, and not whether people want to, to, to make as if there's stuff that um, is trying to be hidden, uh, because that's not my experience of being involved um, uh, Within the, the the review, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tony, Councillor Jackson. Can I chair? And I suppose just to state the fact that there was the consultation process as part of the of of, of developing this report. That's over. You no, know, the report's done. You no, know, a discussion in this chamber isn't changing the report at all. Um, the report is done, you know, and and regardless of a discussion in relation to here, um, or if it's done a full council, it, it actually doesn't change the content of the report one bit. Um, and it was the 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 comments that I was uh, that I made was they have the courtesy to inform those that had took part in the process. They let them know that. The report will be published on this date um, and it's available on the council website, whatever that it was. They have that courtesy. If people feel that they want the debate and take this report apart now ahead of, 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 of and I'm, I'm, when I'm talking about the partners that took part in this, I'm not talking about the independent consultants that were commissioned to carry out the report. I'm talking about the, the local agents. The local environmental groups, the lo and every uh, everybody that that took part in this process, our own planning team, you know, they all were they were all part of the process, and it was to give the the courtesy to everybody. But if somebody wants to try and create a, create some suggestion that there's something on their hand, it's it's ridiculous. Um, we have no issue. Having the conver they, they have the report brought out in the, the open business because it's it's it has an open document. It was just highlighting the concerns that were. It, it's not in the spirit of partnership. It's not because um, the report was developed in partnership with all our bodies. Um, we have we're, we're more almost saying that from this council chamber we need to have it. We need to have the say and and before anybody else. That 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 that's essentially where we're getting at. If people want they um they have the discussion now, um and and go through, we've, we we're not going to stand in the way. It was just banging it up to say that maybe we if we want this process to go forward, if we want to try and work with others, they progress the city and district, um and that and that's that's the whole spirit of of this proposal or this uh 
this piece of work was they improve the system by working together. They be more customer focused. They on all all of that, um, and they make sure that the views of all stakeholders are considered. That's the that was the purpose of this, um, and I, I just felt the proposal almost flayed in the face of that principle. But if others want to do it, we're not going to stand in the way. Um, it was just flight, highlighting that concern that it's it, it is showing a lack of courtesy for other people who have been working with us as partners to try and improve the system. But um, if people want if if people want the um, discuss it now and the proposal has been seconded, um, we won't we won't be opposing it. So um, thanks, Chair. Okay, did, did I get a photo? Oops. Oh, I'm hitting the wrong button. <laughs> Whoops. Um, so at this point then, is everybody in agreement with the proposal? If we're not going to be opposing it, then... Yeah. Okay. That'd be enough. So we'll move that forward to just before we move on to the items that are open for information. Is that okay? No problem at all. Stephen also has an item for Chair's business, so I'll pass yourself, Stephen. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And uh, some members will be aware from uh, certainly from business culture and environment regeneration, the works that will be starting shortly, hopefully with uh, Northern Ireland Water and Foyle Street. And it's just because of the issues with land and how we have to make sure that members are aware and approve whatever we do in relation to land. It's slightly complicated, so I want to give a, a quick update and uh, then I'll hopefully seek your approval. So members will be aware of the works in, in uh, the Northern Ireland Water and Foyle Street. The relationship with Foyle Street is that it's actually a DFC-owned car park that is licensed to council to operate a car park, and Northern Ireland Water want to take over it for a period of 72 weeks. Um, therefore, to do that, uh, we have to enter into a tripartite agreement. It's not just as simple. It's not council grant on Northern Ireland Water. DFC have to grant Northern Ireland Water, but they have to have our approval. So. What I need, to, just to, to be clear, previously we had put through papers where we had agreed the compensation figure, which is 108000 for an annual uh, basis for the car park, which Northern Ireland Water will pay us. And thereafter, every week was at uh, a pro-rated figure of £2,077 per week. Um, I'd say Northern Ireland Water have now confirmed that they need it for a 72-week period. But like all building work, it could run on, so it will run on at £2,077 per week until that is, is relinquished. So in line with authority that I need to counsel the grant, we need to terminate our current licence with DFC to operate that car park. We need to enter into a tripartite agreement, which is DFC, DCSDC and Northern Ireland Water, to terminate the licence and to grant the licence from DFC to take over the car park to Nor for Northern Ireland Water to take over that car park. Um, to agree the additional sum, as they have two thousand and seventy-seven pounds per week for every week beyond the seventy-two week period, and uh, the for the the compensation payments to be paid either directly from Northern Ireland Water to us or uh, via uh, DFC to us, but uh, we're, our preference is directly to us. Um, members should also be aware, and it's not really a risk, but it's just a legal thing, is that once we have terminated the licence, once all of this work is finished and all the car park is put back by Northern Ireland Water in, uh, into a car park, we would then have to enter into a new agreement with DFC to take it back on licence to operate it as a car park. That's just a legal technicality that we will have to do. That will come back to members in due course. So I need the authority from Council to enter into all of those various legal legal agreements. The compensation has already been through DFC, and I'm, I'm aware Northern Ireland Water, I think, have presented to uh, Environment and Regeneration in terms of the works as well. They're very keen to get moving with the actual works, so uh, hence my need to bring it today rather than wait for another committee meeting or full council. So thank you. Happy to take any questions. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Proposals or seconders? <laughs> Proposed by Councillor Tierney, seconded by Chelsea Cook. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we'll move forward then. Um, item seven is the matters arising from the open minutes of the Governance and Strategic Planning Committee held on Tuesday, the 5th of March, 
Do we have any matters arising from that meeting? No. Okay. Item eight is the draft local government remote meetings regulations NI 2024. And I'm going to pass to Rachel for that report. Thanks, Chair. This uh, report really comes from the discussion that we had at the last uh, Governance and Strategic Planning Committee in relation to the, the local government remote meetings regulations. You should be all very much aware that since the 6th of March, councils have no longer the power to hold meetings um, remotely or in hybrid format. So um, since the last meeting, the Communities Minister had asked um, the Department to proceed with draft regs under the Local Government Meetings and Performance Act for 2021. And we, on the 12th of March, received correspondence on a preliminary draft set of regulations. A copy of the correspondence is attached to Appendix 1 in your report, and the copy of the draft regulations is attached at Appendix 2 within your report. Members will be pleased to note that the draft regulations essentially replicate the powers that existed under the previous legislation, um, subject to uh, an obligation to ensure that they're adequately provided for within our standing orders. The lead legal services officer met with representatives from the Department for Communities on the 20th of March and provided some feedback in relation to the draft regs. Um, so the, the recommendation in front of you today, Chair, is just to be updated on the, 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 the emergence of these uh, regula regulations and endorse the progress in expediting the draft regs. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Kutsumini? Thanks, Chair. Well, <coughs> It's really just a welcome this uh, all groups on council here were very adamant that an option of a hybrid meeting should continue if possible. So it's a welcome development that the department have brought forward this legislation. I don't know if council officers have a sense of the time frame as to when this comes into play. And I assume we are still in in-person meetings until until that happens. But be good, you know. Thank you, Councillor Henny. Councillor Harkin. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and I also want to welcome the uh, draft uh, legislation that would allow us to have hybrid meetings. Um, I, I would have preferred that uh, there wasn't a break that we continued to have hybrid meetings, but um, you know this has been fairly quick in terms of uh, when it was uh, when the legislation uh, ended or expired. And I do think that the arguments we made about, uh, you know, for carers, for people who have to travel long distances, who people, for people who might not be able to make it into a meeting physically for whatever reason, they should be able to fully participate, vote. Um, and we've learned that people can do that and that it's worked during the, um, during the period of the, of the pandemic and afterwards. So, um, you know, I would be, I'm happy along with others, hopefully in the chamber to, to endorse this today. Uh, these draft uh, or preliminary uh, proposals and hopefully this can be uh, enacted as soon as possible. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Alderman Cook. Um, thank you. And I just wanted to also welcome the draft legislation as well. Um, we'd be keen to know if there was a timeline of when they would resume hybrid. Thanks. Thanks, Alderman Cook. Councillor Rainey. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I suppose, like others, um, they um, endorse uh, the, the progress that has been made. Um, I think it's been a quick turnaround. Um, I'm not going to go over all of the arguments why I think that hybrid meetings are a good idea, um, because we've we've rehearsed them here already, and I've rehearsed them in, in, in other rooms as well. Um, but just to, to point out that it's quite clear that you know, the, the action that this council took in conjunction with NULGA um, and other councils across the north has been has been listened to. And I think, you know, when you look at the at the timeline um, of correspondence, I think when Rachel started, she said we discussed it at the last meeting, we've already got correspondence to say that the minister's looking at it, blah, blah, blah. I think this is probably, in my experience um, of being in this council, the, the quickest response we've ever had from a government minister. Um, and I hope it continues because we need responses from them on a whole lot of issues. Thank you, Councillor Rachel? 
Yeah, I anticipated that this may be uh, the question. So I spoke to Philip before the meeting and Philip is confident that, well, he, he's assured, well, confident, assured. He, <laughs> Philip feels that we will have it in place for the, at, before the summer recess, which is, we, we reset, recess in August. So um, he thinks by, by then we will be back to the way we used to be. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I think that was a unanimous endorsement from all parties. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So item nine is the Rural Health and Wellbeing Project update. I'm going to pass to Una for that. Thank you, Chair. Um, members, the purpose of this report is to give you an update in terms of the application that's been progressed and also to seek your endorsement. And I think it just really exemplifies the importance of a strategic intervention by council. So in the absence of having dedicated resources within the three rural areas that we set aside £150,000 and £20,000 of that money was used to appoint an external resource to help those three local growth partnerships come together, identify a collective need and also to be able to put that need together in terms of transferable actions that's actually going to build um, resilience and resources within the rural community. And members, you can see that because it is um, a peace application that has got very significant cross-border um, support and um, involvement with Donegal County Council, and we're working with um, initial on rural development and Derek Valley Care, Sport August Spree, and we've also got um, Fairn Consulting working with the three local growth partnerships and as well as RAPID. Members, I suppose what's really significant about this application is not only is it addressing the health and well-being, but it's using local resources within those communities to be able to um, bring together resources, but also in terms of social economy enterprises. So after the peace money has concluded that there's actually projects and um, a capacity built that hadn't been there previously. Um, and you all will be aware that with very successful urban um, family support hubs, we don't have those in the rural area and this project's actually helping to develop those so that's also very significant um members in terms of the consultation we're entering into the final stages of that and that will involve um engagement with the three local growth partnership boards um, the chairpersons and rapid but also a number of key stakeholder groups around health and department of communities and dera and members we're working on the target of having it um, submitted by the 23rd of may and whilst council's helping to facilitate this is actually going to be led and delivered by the three local growth partnerships and the communities and the organizations within those areas and that the, the essence of that is really about building capacity and um, being able to give them something at the end of the project so it's really to give you an update in relation to it and also to seek your endorsement for um, the submission of it for the 23rd of may so happy to take any questions thank you thank you anna councillor farrell <laughs> thanks very much for letting me in uh, you know thank you very much for that presentation and uh, uh, listen uh, we welcome it uh, I uh, live as I said earlier on I'm in the rural area and we need to strengthen them badly you know we need the services there uh, uh, the good thing about it we've uh, identifying the needs in those areas uh, the, a lot of the, the rural areas, I'm in Siam Mills, but uh, you're going to Castle Dare, Collator, uh, Claddy and places like that. They just don't have the services anymore. So, uh, listen, we welcome uh, this uh, application and we endorse it. Thank you, Councillor Farrell. Alderman Cook. Thanks, Chair, for that, man. Um, thanks as well, just for that report. Um, on behalf of the, our rural councillors as well, um, we just want to welcome the progress um, that was made and all the work that the team have put on it. I know that um, the resources will be fairly important to the rural community. So just thanks very much to the team as well. Thank you, Alderman Cook. Councillor Minnie. Thank you, Chair. Just to thank you and to welcome the report. Um, obviously, it's, there's a lot of work on here. Um, C S three point one one, the creation of fifteen to twenty multimodal rural family support hubs, which will be probably a welcome benefit for all those in the rural areas. As I say, the only time I attended a rapid meeting was once, and then it was a relief in my duty from Declan Norris when he came on council. So, well, that's the nearest I've got to any rural issues amongst council so far. But uh, just to say thank you to you and the report, and we welcome it in the SDLP. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Minnie. There wasn't really any questions there, just more positive comments, which is good. Thank you, Una, and unanimous endorsement. So we'll move forward. 
Um, item number 10 is the update on the strategic growth partnership, which was held on the 6th of March. I'll pass over to Rachel for that. Yep. Just briefly, Chair, the purpose of this report is to update you on the meeting of the Strategic Growth Partnership or the Community Planning Partnership, which took part in, on, on the 6th of March. You will be aware that the Strategic Growth Partnership is the governance structure which oversees the implementation of the Strategic Growth Plan and also uh, the local growth plans. Um, and it includes representatives from statutory and support partners, elected reps, uh, social local community planning chairs, private and community and voluntary sector organisations. Just so that we generally do a report for information to the governance and strategic planning committee for each of the each of the meetings, but we just thought for today it might be useful just to raise it up uh, so that we can um, just keep the focus on it. So in terms of the last meeting uh, we had on March, we had an update from the Department for Communities, who are obviously the lead central government department in charge of community planning. And they give us an update on a review that's underway regionally to look at um, how communi community planning is working across all the 11 council areas. And they reflected on a, a conference that was going to be held on the 12th of March, which um, some of our, we were all invited to as a strategic growth partnership members to look at, sort of celebrate the work that each of the growth partners or the community planning partnerships are involved in. We also um, had a presentation from Rapid, um, uh, just building on what UNID's report was, just around the rural support services that they provide. And we also uh, had another third milestone for us. We approved our final, our third statement of progress, um, which is our performance report in terms of how the strategic growth plan is performing. Um, so, so that was a third performance report we published on that. And also we um, approved a reviewed eight local growth plans. So it's quite a lot of a lot of approvals at that meeting. Um, members, just so that you're aware, for those that aren't on the Strategic Growth Partnership, we, we do, do, do update reports into this committee, but all the information, all the papers and everything are on our website, which is Grow Dairy Straban, and it's linked there within your report. So if, you're, if you wish to take a look at further information, it's all there. Um, our next meeting members is on the 14th of June and uh, after that we will obviously put a report into this committee so it's just really to keep you updated on the progress of the strategic growth partnership chair thank you thank you Rachel Councillor Farrell thanks chair and thanks Rachel uh, for, for the the update um, I was at the last strategic growth partnership uh, and I found it all very interesting but what I want to touch on is the statement of progress. Um, and I had raised this item specifically at the last meeting. Um, there, we have 30 priority actions included in the statement of progress, or included in the strategic growth plan. Um, out of the 30, 26 were on track, um, but there was four that were amber, which, um, the, the rate of progress w was less than planned um, and it was around improved road infrastructure, improved rail infrastructure, um, connectivity and sustainability of CODA and university expansion. Um, and the suggestion I made at the strategic growth partnership was that we should focus on areas where we're not achieving green and that we should invite the key delivery partners to future meetings of the strategic growth partnership so we can get updates on what exactly is happening um, with each of those sort of key strategic projects and whilst i agree that that is the way forward that we need to engage with you know, the relevant stakeholders the, the departmental leads um, I, I think we can do more than that in fairness so there's a number of critical projects that will make a massive, massive difference to this city and district. And every single party and individual agrees with this because it's in this council's strategic growth plan. In terms of roads, the A6 isn't finished. The A5 hasn't started. The A2 widening of Bunkrana Road has been shelved indefinitely. In terms of rail, Funding has not been agreed, agreed for the phase three Derry to Coleraine upgrade. Funding has not been agreed for feasibility studies for stops at Eglinton, Ballykelly, and Strathfoyle. Uh, funding hasn't been agreed for feasibility studies for the half hourly service uh, to Belfast. In terms of the airport, 
the revised business case is sitting on a ministerial desk in Stormont, and if agreed, it could save repairs in the southern district three and a half million pound a year. And McGee expansion four years ago, new decade, new approach said that proposals for 10,000 students would be brought forward. They haven't been brought forward. We've had the recent announcement about the task force, which is going to be led by Stephen Kelly. That's really, really welcome. Uh, but what we need is a bare minimum of 10,000 students. But whatever recommendations come out of that task force, they need to be financed uh, and they need to be implemented. Um, so our view on that is that you know these projects are critical. These projects are crucial. It's really important that it's in our strategic growth plan. What would be a real statement of intent from the new Northern Ireland executive would be that each of those projects are included in the program for government. Um, so each of those projects, you know, th there's a minister in Stormont that, that has the power, has the funding, has the responsibility to deliver on each of those projects. And we believe they need to take ownership they need to take responsibility. They need to ensure that the funding is there and they need to ensure that each of those projects are included in the programme for government. So based on that, I've got a proposal that I've sent to Paula, um, which should appear very, very shortly. Um, maybe not. Anytime now. Yeah. <laughs> So Council recognises the vital importance of the strategic growth plan, notes with concern that the rate of progress is less than planned on four key projects, namely university expansion, improved road infrastructure, enhanced rail service, and improved connectivity and sustainability of City of Derry Airport. And we'll write to the Ministers for Economy and Infrastructure requesting progress updates on these projects and that a firm commitment on each project is included in the forthcoming programme for government. Thank Ian, you. Councillor Tierney has indicated that he's going to second that, just um, for the record. Does anybody wish to speak on the proposal, or do you need a couple of months to consider it? No. <laughs> Or your mic still on, just so you know. Councillor Harkin, go ahead. Yeah, um, I have no problem supporting the proposal. Uh, I agree. I think that these are very important projects, and I don't think that they're moving fast enough. That's obvious to everybody in the chamber. And I think while Stormont was down, uh, there was a ready-made excuse that we could make no progress. But now Stormont is back, and I think that we have to uh, ratchet up. Um, because we've lost time on a lot of these projects. And I wanted to just highlight one to underscore, uh, I suppose, my frustration, but it'll be shared by lots of other people. I mean, the phase three upgrade of the, the Derry to Coleraine line was supposed to be finished in 2013, and it still isn't done. And as uh, Councillor Farrell pointed out, the third phase uh, isn't completed yet because the funding hasn't been guaranteed, so it's being delayed again. And this is a track that we know is secondhand, secondhand, literally secondhand tracks, um, which keeps the train slow. Um, but this is the easy part to do. But yet, it's a decade now of delay. And it's very frustrating when we open up the newspapers and we read about a £142 million pound spend plan to further develop the Belfast to Dublin line. And I think that this feels like a bit of a slap in the face for people in Derry and the Northwest, given how much of the rail review focused on the lack of um, rail services for the Northwest. Um, <clears throat> so fully endorse the proposal. I think we have to be uh, raising the alarm on these issues. Otherwise, they will get lost in the many issues that, that uh, Stormont departments are trying to deal with. Uh, and an additional issue after we they vote in this, uh, Chair. No problem. Councillor Jackson. And I suppose we've we've all agreed on the key priorities as part of the growth plan um, and we need to see delivery on them. We can't ignore the fact that 
that some of from from our perspective there had been some of those projects that have been deliberately held back um we have seen a change in the political makeup of those departments um and hopefully in turn we will see we, we will see progress in these uh, um and and it's it, it'll be no surprise that from from this part of the world that we are asking for for these key strategic projects to be included in the program for government it's it, it's it's understandable that that would come from this chamber um the and so we've we've no we've no issue in relation to making that call and asking the executive it's but it it's good to see that people recognize the importance of being in government you no know, like, like we've got a proposal here um from a party that's refusing to sit in government refusing but um ask but dictating from the sidelines of what should be on a program for government i think if we want to deliver for this part of of the world and and try and address the regional imbalance that's existed as a result of partition we need to be working together we need everybody to be to be um to be to be part to be part of that collective leadership and um patching from the sidelines if that's what uh if, that, if that's what people are offering um uh, I, I, I can't see it achieving too much but in relation to this the, the proposals in front of us um it's a no-brainer that we've agreed the, these actions these priorities as part of the the growth plan we need to see them delivered um and thankfully now we do have ministers in place that have that are that have openly stated in in the, in the first weeks in office that the priorities is addressing regional imbalance um and we, we as a council we need to continue to continue to keep raising it i know from our perspective we'll continue to raise it within the party um and hope all our parties uh realize the importance of working together and um and put in delivery and, and addressing the inequalities that exist thanks chair Thanks, Councillor Jackson. I haven't heard anybody speak against the proposal, so I am going to take it that it is unanimous. Councillor Harkin, you had something else you wanted to raise from this report? Yeah, yeah, I agree that uh, parties need to work together, and I hope that Sinn Féin and the DUP can continue to work together in the way that they have been over the last uh, couple of months. Um, so the the additional issue I wanted to raise was really just, I mean, we've, be, we've been talking a lot about um, can, can, residents have been raising a lot of concerns about HMOs in, in the foil side DA in particular, but in other DAs as well. And the local growth plans do have discussions in there about, in particular, the foil side. There is quite a few references in the local growth plan to uh, working with Ulster University about developing uh, a plan for student accommodation, um, and uh, which is good. But now that will actually have to be progressed, and I and I I, I believe that um, I'm not sure if the uh, any Ulster uh, Ulster University University officials have got back to the council yet about our request for a meeting about student accommodation plans. Um, I know that they they've went to other places, but in terms of the council, um, my understanding is that they still haven't responded. Uh, it'd be good if they did because uh, they should be willing to meet with the council to talk through these plans. And the, the other issue is the, the, um, the plans that we do have for HMO management areas, which are in draft right now, I think we'll need to look at them again, because um, I think nobody necessarily foreseen an explosion of HMO growth related to Ulster University. And I think that residents have been contacting me who know that the the proposed figure is 30%. You can't, but that would be the proposal for areas that would have HMOs that would be limited or capped at 30% of houses in a particular area. And I think many people think that that's too high. Um, and high because we could see a huge spread in, in particular areas of, of foil side. So I just want to get this on record, I don't have a proposal 
but um, since it was a discussion about strategic growth plans, local growth plans, um, this is one issue that is that is being discussed. If any officers have any comments, I'd be, I'd be uh, happy to hear them as well. I think those comments have been noted. I don't think we are aware of a response from the university at this point, but I'm sure that we can check that out in advance of all council if there has been or, or not, or come back to you otherwise. Happy enough? Okay. So we'll move forward. Item 11 is the report on the job start scheme and Paul is going to take us through that. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Chair. The purpose of this report is to provide members with information on the job start scheme and seek approval to progress as recommended. Funding is currently available from the Department of Communities to allow employers to create new high quality job opportunities to help young people aged 16 to 24 at risk of long term un unemployment to enter the job market. Um, these job opportunities created with job start funding must not replace existing or plan or plan vacancies and um, can't cause existing employees or contractors to lose or reduce their employment. The roads must be for a minimum of 25 hours per week for six months or nine months if applicable. It must be paid at least the national minimum wage for the age group. And also um, to join the scheme, the participants should not require um, extensive training before they begin the job. So the council has commenced offering these opportunities to individuals who wish to participate. When they have successfully completed the scheme, we will automatically register those um, trainees on council's casual registers. Um, they will then be also in a better position to meet criteria for range of positions, which will be trawled or advertised within the council and also external organisations. Um, during their time with the council, we will also provide them with the relevant training and mentorship um, to help them successfully complete the scheme. To date, we have appointed three job start trainees here within visitor services in the Guildhall. And at the minute, we're also advertising for trainees and um, for general admin roles, as well as leisure and sports related roles. So it's recommended that members note the report and endorse approval to progress with the scheme. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Any member wish to make a comment on this report? Councillor Harkin, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you, Paula, for the report. And uh, I think that Paula agreed to bring this forward off the back of a concern that I had raised about jobs being advertised uh, at uh, at where younger people would be paid the, the lower minimum wages. Um, and that as a council, we have taken a clear stand that we, we don't support that and we want to see equal work, equal pay for equal work. And um, I think that this is a good scheme uh, in the sense that if it, uh, you know, does what it aims to do, which is to allow younger people a pathway into jobs at the council, I think that that would be very, very good. Um, I, I do see that it says that they should be paid at least the national minimum wage and this would be funded I presume that these jobs are in part funded by the department. Um, so if there was a way for us to, even while they're doing their training, to um, bring up their wages to the, to the full rate, I would be in favour of that. And I think that that would be in line with council policy. Um, I, I also wanted to, and I wasn't able to, chat with uh, a trade union representative because I just wanted to see if they had been consulted in this. So maybe they have, um, but I wasn't able to, to speak to any of, the, of their officers. Um, and I just think that you know, th this issue is important because um, young people are paid. Uh, if you're under 18 or under, uh, I think that the rate right now has been, in, if you're under 20, you're paid 860 an hour. If you're under 18, you're paid 640 an hour. Um, this is just far too low for people. And I think that our council should be doing everything it can to um, uh, eradicate them pay scales for younger people. Um, it's also the case that Stormont, since new decade, new approach, has the ability to take control of setting wage levels. Uh, they haven't done that yet, but, but Stormont itself could actually abolish those lower rates and could institute a higher rate of pay. Um, and I think that that's something that we would want to see the, the restored storm and doing as quickly as possible. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Councillor Minnie. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to come on this, um, 
I know Paul presented a report, but I contacted you a short while back about um, I was contacted by a local constituent too about the about the advertisements she saw for the visitor centre for the museum and, and obviously what brought her brought this person's attention was the the rates of the rates of pay as well and your reply was very helpful. But in light of what Councillor Hargan was um, outlining there, um, broadly we support of that as well. But what implication would it be if there was that? Uh, for any of those, you know, um, if you were to mind, if we were to mind that they raise those pay scales on those in relation to the job start program, what would that be, what cost would that be council or would the EFC or parent any parent department pick that up? Just to, some background that would be quite helpful as well. Please, thank you. So sorry, just in terms of uh, two queries, one that Councillor Harkin raised, it has been discussed with the um, the trade unions at our latest JSC and C meeting. Um, in terms of okay, the rates of pay, uh, um, the fact that we are that you know we are recommending that they go onto the casual list as soon as they've completed the training, because we would hope at the end of that training period that those trainees will be skilled and have had the training to do the full job and will be in a position to move on to the full job description, which they would get the relevant rate the relevant rate of pay. We can consider um, paying the you know our, our, our minimum wage. However, there will be cost implications, and again, I would have to bring back a further report and look at how we've you know if, if there's budget for that within the sections so what i would recommend would be that you know we give this you, you know the, the train if we run it for 12 months and look how successful has it been and then maybe bring back a further report recommending what we do for you know for the next 12 months with some cost implications thanks paula councillor farrell uh, th thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Paula. Here, just a question in terms of you know the scope of this. Um, how many people are we targeting in terms of you know because it is a scheme that's being rolled out across the north. We're a massive employer across the southern district. We've got we're a massive organisation with a wide spectrum of roles that would suit a variety of different people with different skill sets. And I don't think it should be about you know training people to do only do future roles in council. It should be about just giving them job experience so they can get jobs anywhere. Uh, about improving their employability. So, how many people? Because they're saying, "Oh, we've got three jobs, three trainees and visitor services, advertising, and different departments." So, have we got a target of we want twenty or thirty trainees, or what way does that work? Uh, for example, we're at, out at the minute for admin. If we get 10 who want to join the scheme, we will find 10 placements for them. So it is very open. It's really, um, you know, as many as we can, uh, you know, as many as we can attract, plus uh, the department can accommodate. For example, in leisure, you know, we have agreed a target of two or three for each for each leisure centre. And, you know, we hope hopefully we'll we'll get enough trainees for that but there is there's no there is no um maximum it's you know it's we're trying to promote the program and try to encourage through the schools and through job fairs etc you know the benefits of it but we don't we don't have a limit you know so it'll be interesting to see how many we know that are, are coming forward for the leisure and the admin roles Thank you, Paula. I don't have anybody else indicated to speak. I think I don't think there's been anybody speaking against the, the recommendation in the report, but it might be useful for a further report to be brought back in terms of the costs and the questions that have been asked, um, just to sort of give us an idea of what that might might look like. Yes. Uh, so suggest bringing that back maybe at the end of this current 26 weeks when the yeah. first... For, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that moves us on to... The planning, the, the item that we've brought out of confidential, so item 14 has been moved forward. And Eamon, I'll pass over to yourself to give us that report. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, members. Um, members, the purpose of this report is to provide members an update on the independent planning review of Council's planning service and to provide members with the final draft of the independent review and the re recommendations of the planning working group and to seek members' endorsement and approval for the recommendations contained in the review 
and the proposed implementations of the recommendations. And members will be aware that Council agreed to commission this report um, in its independent review in light of the two reports published, one by the um, NIAO and one by the Public Accounts Committee um, in early uh, 2022. Uh, Council appointed our LOCI planning um, to conduct the review. And this work has been ongoing between um, November 22 and January 24. Um, the, this was a member-led initiative, and uh, the consultants sought uh, directions throughout the, the commission of this uh, work through the planning uh, planning working group. And the consultants presented a final draft report to the working group um, uh, on uh, in January of 2024 for members' comment. Um, the final draft has now been reported. It's attached for members' um, information and attention, and it's presented here for your endorsement and approval. Um, senior officers have met with elected members just to, to uh, ensure um, if there were any issues with regard to accuracy with the report. Um, members will also recall that the Council had uh, commissioned a previous report in uh, 2017, and the report resulted in 73 recommendations to improve the service. And the current report also examined uh, the, uh, the uh, recommendations from MIAO and the Public Accounts Committee in the relevance to the Council and also progress that had been made. Um, <clears throat> the review um, had focused on five key stakeholder groups that are outlined there for members' attention. Um, and they also met with uh, the RTBI, DFI, and various government uh, agencies and also neighbouring councils. <clears throat> the report finds that while significant progress had been made, and with 93% of the 2017 uh, report has been fully or partially, partially implemented, um, there were areas that participants um, to the current review um, had concerns about, and those are listed there, transparency, communication, an outcome focus for the service, sustainability, equitable equitability uh, and efficiency. And based now on the findings um, of the work that they have carried out, the uh, consultants have made a series of 12 recommendations, and within those 12 recommendations, there are subsets um, uh, for improving the council's service and respond uh, for council to respond to customer customer needs. Um, in addition, as part of the commission, um, the consultants have provided a monitoring uh, framework and an action plan for implementation. And the planning working group now has recommended um, that the council uh, engage the uh, our LOCI consultants to provide the support in monitoring and implementation of the report. And a copy of the report is uh, attached for members' consideration. Um, obviously, members, in terms of uh, equality, rural needs, climate change, etc., there will be an additional cost associated with the appointment of the consultants to support the implementation. Um, of the report and any further cost implications regarding resources within the service um, would be subject to a separate report uh, to Council. Uh, the recommendations uh, for today, members, are that members' endorsement is sought for the report and the recommendations um, contained therein, that members approve and appoint our LOCI uh, planning to support the implementation of the report through the implementation and monitoring framework, and that members approve the distribution of the report directly to the participants who participated in the review process and also through publication on the Council's website. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Eamon. Councillor Jackson. Come on, good chair. And I suppose there was a few um, of the processing concerns or concerns around the process that, that would have preferred the the raising confidential. Um, but what, what the decision's been taken. Um, they 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 have this in, in open business, and I know the report is the report um, and. We've we've asked for the report to be commissioned. Um, it's independent, not questioning that in any way. Um, there's there's a few of the recommendations that I would like a bit, a bit more clarity on. Um, but I suppose the principle of us taking a decision now, because because we when we when we em, embarked on this journey, um, it was. We we seen it as a two phase 
no, we the, the first phase was that we carry out this risk review um, that we assess uh, assess it against the audit office reports um, and that we have that widespread consultation. But the second part, um, the second phase was that there would be council would would seek um, further support with implementation of any changes. And I, and I think we specifically said that there, you know, we, we would take a pause at this stage and look at um, appointing somebody with a track record on that change, the, the, the implementing change. And I haven't got that level of detail. Um, so we're, at, we're being asked to take a decision to appoint um, an independent consultant um, they support council with the change uh, with that change implementation, and that, that may be appropriate. I just uh, just haven't been given because uh, we're we're like we're investing significant amount of repairs money um, to improve the service, and want to make sure that it's value for repairs money, and that that we're appointing the best people for for the role. We, there's, it's an absolutely no doubt that that the people that can carry out this report were um, the best people to be to be doing that piece of work. They may be the best people to for they, they, they undertake the, the change implementation, but um, I just haven't been given that detail around what the different options are. Um, is there is there any is, is you no know, is it more beneficial? That it's somebody from without, with, or from beyond these council areas. Um, is, it, is there anybody closer to home that has that exper expertise around change implementation? Um, that's that, that element of it. I, I'm just not comfortable um, at this stage to be signing off on that part of the recommendation. In, in relation to the recommendations, it's contained within the report. And this is where we are being asked they they endorse all the recommendations as a whole, and the the one like there's 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 the vast majority of them are extremely positive, um, and they're self-explanatory. Um, it's it's important. I think it's it's from from the discussions that we've been having as part of that working group. Um, a single point of contact um, within the system. They provide better communication, enhanced communication for strategic applications. is a no-brainer. Um, the six monthly meeting with um, with developers, you know, at developer forum, so we can attract investment, make the most of. Uh, and and show that this council area is open for business. We want to overcome any challenges in relation to the planning system. That six month forum, monthly forum, could be key to 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 selling this part of the world. They they attract investment done. They create jobs. They deliver homes. Look, it's it's ridiculous that we've got a housing crisis, where we at the, and at the same time we've vast swathes of land that's owned for housing. So we we need. We need that focus, and that's saying, and in relation to bringing investment in, the overcoming challenges in relation to planning. So that's encouraging. Would have liked to have seen the same approach being taken to, you know, because it says we should establish regular liaison uh, forum with environmental action groups. Now, like if we're having a six monthly forum with developers, um, no. Can we put a time frame on in relation to the the you know, that engage and a similar time frame in relation to the engagement with environmental action groups? Uh, now, and, and I'm I'm not suggesting changing the report. I'm just um, and I know that 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 is within our gift is you know that that we can that, that, like, the the recommendations is that we have um, that we have that regular forum. I think. Maybe being more specific 
um, in line with the, engage, the development forum um, might be helpful. Um, the, a big one that's going to be a cause of contention for the Council's planning committee is, is remove, amending the scheme of delegation they, so that all refusals don't come under committee. Like we know, and, and we know from those that are on the committee, the, that scheme of delegation was amended by members because of specific concerns in relation to policy surrounding rural housing, and that's and we have seen the committee unanimously, um, well mostly unanimously, um, overturning some of the refusals on rural and single houses in the countryside. And it's because we've all got a desire, it's a desire of this, of this council to support rural communities. And that recommendation in number nine will have a massive impact on, on our rural communities um, because we're still seeing those refusals coming in. Um, it is contained within the report that there's a need for for an up an updated policy in relation to houses in the countryside, and and um, and, and that's not there. Um, so we, if we're going to change the scheme of delegation, um, you're still going back and falling back on the same outdated policies um, that will ultimately result on um, a loss of opportunity for, for people they love in the countryside. So there's there, there's issues. No, and another point that, and, and I, can, I can clearly see the, I, I can, clearly, can clearly see the benefits of, of, of some of the recommendations. And um, like there's one that, the planning committee should regularly or routinely visit all sites relating to major planning applications um, before we make a decision. Now, I know um, it, but it looks to this, it looks like there's going to be quite a lot of additional site visits for the planning committee. Um, but and but you, you wouldn't want to see that being an additional barrier or delaying an app in the processing of application because the whole purpose of this piece of work was to help streamline um, and create a more efficient system um, and you know, by putting additional steps in, by making it mandatory that there's additional meetings uh, or site visits that are taking place before decisions are taken could ultimately delay um, the, a, a decision on, on an application. So, I can understand how it can lead to better de decision making or more de informed decisions being taken, um, but it's just that added step almost goes against the principle of this piece of work is that we were trying to make things more streamlined, looking at ways that we can make this. When somebody puts an application in, in this council area, it's processed much quicker than anywhere else. And we, uh, whether it's an approval or it's a refusal, a decision has come to um, within a very quick time frame, and that's the, and that that's what we're hoping to get out of that. Um, and I, I accept that the uh, uh, the bona fides of of those that carried out this report. So it's almost the. We, we want to work through these recommendations to see what impact it has, but it does, it, it does, it, 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 there's, there's, there's elements of it that I would question um, whether it's going to have the desired impact. Mightn't know that until we try it, um, but it's, and, and from our perspective, we're open to trying absolutely anything. Um, but, it's. I'm, I'm just conscious we're we're having this discussion, in, um, in an open forum, where there's other people that were part of the process, that uh, that formulated these recommendations, 
and they're not being part of these discussions. Um, and that's that's the but that I, that that is it, it's it's a, it's a bit strange. Um, but we 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 entered under this process with 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 a clear determination that we wanted to see a more efficient system. We wanted to ease help ease the pressure that's on our planning. Um, planning officers and on the planning system and we can create a more streamlined um, service that people that that delivers for people that we can see development that we can see decisions that are being taken we can see decisions taken in a more timely manner and we can we can use the levers and power that's available to us in council they they make a huge dent on the housing crisis that we're experiencing in, in, in the city at the moment so that's that. That's what we went on the, and that was that's what we wanted to see out of, come out of this. If the implementation of these recommendations is going to get us there, then we're we're up for it. It's not going to be without its challenges when I when I'm reading through the recommendations, but despite all of that, the, the end goal is is too important. We want to see the planning system deliver for the people of of, of this city and district. Um, we want to ensure that developers have confidence um in this in, in, in investing in their city and district and we want to see we want to ensure that we can that development can go hand in glove and it's not a, a an in detriment to their environment so everybody we, we need to have everybody on board on this um and if if these recommendations get us to that place, then it's a job well done. But um, uh, but I suppose we won't know until we try it. So from our perspective, we're committed. The, the implementation of these the, these recommendations. But uh, um, I, I know from experience on the planning committee, some of them are going to be extremely difficult. Um, but we'll we'll give it a shot. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Uh, Councillor Donnelly. I think Councillor Harkin indicated by form me, Chair. Did you get him now? Was he on the list? Right. So, Chair, look, I, I do have a proposal, but uh, I'll fly through this. Uh, I have uh, issues too with, with the report or concerns, and it is a, a very extensive report, but one of them would, you know, it's it's that what's described as an enabling mindset rather than a, a regulatory one. Uh, and chair, I'm not an expert, but what I take from that that it reinforces the drift of planning uh, further towards a, a market-driven neoliberalism. And and that phrase "open for business" could could confirm that. While economic economic growth and developer-led interests. Are important they should not take priority over the needs of those we represent and the protection of the environment economic growth growth at all costs is not a sustainable model for our planning service as the disasters in uh, my boy and Loch Ness would would testify chair is one of the few councillors who do who does regularly uh, attend events of of the environmental group the gallery and I have confidence in in in, in their collective ability and, vo and voice in expressing why our planning system is broken and what needs to be done to address such dire levels of, of, of mistrust. But I'm also concerned, Chair, that, and, and I do take Councillor ja Jackson's, you know, about these people do need to be consulted and do need to, to have a, you know, be talked to and, 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 and listen to regarding this, this report. And I think that should happen before it's uh, before it's uh, finalised. I know some people will say it is finalised, but or accepted or in, in, in endorsed. I think we do need to listen to them, and I have a proposal at the end of this. But I do also believe that the report could be accused of downplaying the real extent of the planning system, uh, that how it's affecting our citizens. For me, public mistrust is the biggest issue that this council needs to address. For example, 79% of those providing input felt that our planning service never or only occasionally delivered on citizens' key priorities. 
when we consider that these include sustainable development, citizen well-being, honesty, transparency, integrity and accountability, etc. Surely we need to take a closer look at the why we have, why so many people have this perception, uh, particularly among stakeholders. It rightly highlights a, wor a worry that 22% of participants believe that the planning system is broken beyond repair, uh, but puts a positive spin that over 70% feel that, that the serious failures of our planning service can be addressed. That could be accused of, of, of maybe stretching it a bit. And Chair, only last night I, I had a phone call from yet another citizen, a man whose family has been traumatised by this council's approach to an alleged planning offence carried out at a time when this family urgently needed to provide care to an elderly and disabled relative who had taken seriously ill. Chair, and, and I am currently making arrangements to, to, to meet this, this family to, to see what we can do about that. And that, that's not, not an isolated incident. So I think that we can't lose sight of the fact that at present, 75% of respondents considered that this council's planning service is broken. There's an awful lot to take in, in in such a short time, but while this report makes a series of recommendations, it potentially, it potentially falls short on explaining why a big majority of stakeholders have such a poor opinion of this council. And Chair, I'd like to bring a proposal and that in proposing today that this committee holds off on agreeing or ratifying or whatever the terminology needs to be this report until it is provided to the, the stakeholders for their, their comments given the serious issue of mistrust. And I would suggest that stakeholders from the gallery and, and all our interested parties are, are invited to present to this council on their concerns and potential solutions to addressing serious public mistrust in this council's planning services. And I do have a, a, a proposal that people can discuss and, and I hope we we yeah I've sent it to Paula and I hope we can work together on this in order to try and get this fixed or at least allow people a to have for that address it. Thanks, Thanks Karen. Thank you. We'll take the proposal. Councillor Harkins happy to say are you looking to speak to the proposal as well, Councillor Harkin? Second and speak. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm happy to second Councillor Donnelly's proposal. I think that um, I wouldn't be happy to sign off in this document today um, because I do feel like we need to have more input and, and uh, by signing off on it, uh, we're basically agreeing it and then it moves forward. So the point of uh, Councillor Donnelly's motion is to actually invite participation uh, before we fully ratify and move on and then implement the, the, the recommendations. And, and there's, there is... I know a lot, a, a lot of work went into this uh, document, and it is a lot of reading, and there's a lot to decipher, and there is, uh, I would say, uh, y you know, a lot of work uh, uh, has been done to identify and how we can resolve some of the issues. But the item number three, recommendation number three, stands out for me as a as a huge concern, because um, it says that we should encourage and develop an enabling culture rather than a regulatory one. And that is that can be interpreted in different ways, right? We've went through now three decades of deregulation uh, that has allowed for uh, the wrecking of our environment um, because that is a driver of climate breakdown. We have uh, water pollution issues here in the north, but right across the world because of deregulation. Um, so I think that they actually say, and after the disaster of Loch Ness and my boy, they actually say publicly, we are going to have, we are going to en uh, encourage people not to be regulatory minded uh, is, is a serious issue. That means people have no confidence in the actual regulations, which means we need better regulations, or it means that the regulations um, are a problem. And so that's why I think it's a big issue because there's, a, there's different ways you can interpret that. I, I think it's dangerous language to say we need an enabling culture and not regulatory one because we want to say to the world we're open for business because that can actually, that has, that has driven um, exploitation uh, of our environment. That has led to a lot of the problems with infrastructure. That has led to a whole series of problems that we are, we are trying to clean up and deal with. So I think that 
that that would be one thing I would not be happy to sign off on. And I think lots of people who are in the environment movement, people who were happy to see the council support climate uh, pledges and so on, uh, would be confused about that wording um, and, and about what that could mean and how it could be interpreted and what message it might send. So I think that that, is, uh, that stands out for me as one uh, that would be uh, very problematic. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Councillor Tierney. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, and if you don't mind, Chair, I'll uh, speak to the report um, that has been presented by officers and the proposal which is before us as well. Um, and I, um, first of all, um, want to point out that when looking and considering the independent review, I think you have to cast your memory back to where we were um, before it was actually uh, initiated. Um, and it's no secret that we had um, audit office reports and we had um, developers coming out publicly and saying that they couldn't do business here because of the planning system and the log jams were done. And I thought at the time, and the SDLP thought at the time, that having this review was a good idea for everybody concerned. And it was a good idea for, for a number of reasons, because it brought stakeholders around the table. It allowed the planning staff, in my opinion, the experts, to have their say on how the system is running, where they find the difficulties um, and where they find the barriers. Um, and that opportunity for people to have their, their voice heard, rather than just um, these, in many occasions, anecdotal complaints um, that, that we hear as councillors. And as I said already, um, the SDLP were, were, were fully engaged in, in the process um, of the review. Um, I had attended a number of the meetings. I didn't attend them all. I'll make that confession, but we were represented at them all. Um, and I had feedback from, from our group um, on how the process w was going. I have concern um, like Councillor Jackson, around 5.2, um, because I don't know um, how um, the consultant's experience, knowledge um, around initiating the implementation or, or the change process within the planning um, system. I don't know, and I, and I would like to see maybe a wee bit more information on how 5.2 ended up in the report. Um, we don't normally um, see that. But I think the the main thing around this report is trying to make the system better for everybody. And I think that's key in all of this. Um, the opportunity to have the, the forums, I think, is very, very welcome um, with the opportunity for people to feed in because the implementation of this probably isn't going to be smooth. It's going to be difficult, it's going to be a bumpy road, and it's going to take a bit of time for, for things to bear in. So having those forums and those opportunities to say, well, you know, that was in the report, it might not be the best idea, could we look at it this way? I think it's a very, very good idea. I think one point of contact is a very, very good idea, and I've raised my concerns around um, not having the one person, the one point of contact with officers, um, and, and I definitely agree that that is something um, that, that we should be rolling out. Well, I think the report um, is welcome. I would like to see and hopefully see um, the speedy implementation of a lot of the recommendations because I think the speedy implementation will see our planning system um, become better. It will give our planning officers um, the understanding and if you want the comfort to know that their views have been listened to um, and that we're trying to support them as, and making that system um, more, more streamlined. So I think there's a lot of good things within the report and I, I've, I've already outlined my concerns. Um, on the proposal, and I said when I spoke about this at the beginning, uh, but just before I go to the proposal, sorry, in relation to the having this conversation of open business, I think it's important to point out that there was no process to have views heard from those who fell under this anyway. We were told by the officer at the beginning that the report was going to be posted out and, and that was it. 
Um, so whether we have it now or whether we have it after, after the end, there was no process around that, and I think that's important to, to, to outline. But on the proposal, and I said when I spoke at the beginning of the meeting that I wasn't going to comment on whether people attended or didn't attend the, the planning uh, review. But that proposal, in my opinion, is asking this council to do what this council has just done. That's my view on that proposal with the greatest respect to the proposer and, and the seconder. I would also point out that this report in item number 14 is titled Independent Planning Review. If we agree and accept that proposal, it no longer becomes independent because this council will and the stakeholders within it have the opportunity to change it. It's no longer independent. And I have issues with that. People spoke at the beginning of the meeting around transparency. That interferes with transparency, in my view. Now, I don't know, as I've said already, Chair, and I'm being upfront and honest, I don't know whether people attended the planning review or whether they didn't. But I do know that the two members who have proposed and seconded this proposal were members of this council when this review was initiated. It was initiated through a notice of motion and they, the they were here. They had the opportunity to speak. I can't recall whether they did, but what I do know is they weren't listening because to propose that shows me clearly that they weren't listening because that is the outcome of the report that we have before us. I would like to know, and people are talking up and trying to insinuate for months that there's something to hide within this council. I've heard the word witch hunt used. I've heard the word dodgy land deals used. All of this stuff. Why would people want to hold up something which was brought in to improve something? Doesn't make any sense to me. And because of those reasons, the SDLP will not be supporting that proposal in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. Councillor Jackson? Um, I suppose just to go back on the point that um, we've talked about the process and I think the, the fundamental principle here is, and, and Councillor Tierney touched on it, is that this is an independent report um, and you know, the, it, it sort of loses its value if we say that we don't agree with it and we're going to make changes to it and all that. I know we've got control over the steps that we take in relation to the implementation of the change that's needed, but the report, the authors of the report have clearly stated the recommendations that they feel would be important to take the, the, um, the, the improve the service. And that's, and that, that's what we want to see. I am, um, We're we're facing. We, like we've we've touched on on the 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 growth partnership uh, aspirations of the growth plan, and the challenges that we, we want to see. We want to see delivery on, on and, and I make no apology from saying that this council area is open for business. We're open for business. They see investment in our university. They see investment in our roads. They see investment in in the rail infrastructure. And we, we want to see that the, 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 the this council play a role in addressing the housing crisis. Um, that's, uh, and we're, we're not going to make any apologies for that. Um, it does need to be done in a sustainable way, but we need to ensure that if there's any blockages, if there's any bureaucracy contained within the planning system at this moment in time, that we look to address it and remove it. This report does highlight that and, and I know it was contained within the, the the previous recommendations that was carried out by this these this this same uh, this same consultancy group um, and one of the key recommendations is that we have a customer fa face a customer based approach um, that we do look um, they enable um, development within our our, our our city and district and if and and work we're, we're committed we're committed to that. We're committed to see delivery. Um, we can't be in a situation where we're asking for reports. If we don't like the outcome, then we ask for the reports to be changed. Um, and, and, and I know 
there's, I think maybe the the proposer of this the, uh, this proposal um, is hiding behind that some way, but or, or some of the confidential reports that are coming on because, and I'm going to be clear and in, 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 in open business, there's been other reports that the proposer has asked for. The council have spent tens of thousands of pounds, and he doesn't like the outcome of them, so he's asking for another hundred thousand pound to be spent. That. That's ridiculous. Um, and clarification, I've never asked for hundreds of thousands. Of, well, can, he, so, can he be more specific? Uh, look, I welcome this open business. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be. I'll, away, be more specific, but fair I'll, to I'll, it. I'll, I'll, I'll be more. I'll, Chair, please. I'll, I'll, there, 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 well, Councillor Donnelly has has announced himself as a whistleblower um, in relation to um, a, a complaint against council. There was there was a report that was that was done that cost this council thirty thousand pounds could potentially cost this council he's not happy with the report and um, because it doesn't it doesn't contain the information that he that he wants to see so he's asked council to contain or to do another report that could potentially cost another fifty thousand pounds now that's there, there was there was another accusation that he made um the council investigated the cost the, the, and the cost in the region of Five thousand pound. Um, there was no. Uh, again, it, it was comparing the applications. We got the report. The information was clear. There was absolutely no wrongdoing by this council, and 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 and, and it went. Um, but there was, and and, and we, we've just moved on now. If Councillor Donnelly wants us. They continue to go around in circles, spending hundreds of thousands of pounds or tens of thousands of pounds um, on of repairs money, on some sort of uh, confused the word witch hunt, um, but it, so, just in this continuous loop of inv council investigating itself, asking all our people to investigate ourselves, with a, when when our focus is and 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 if that's where Councillor Donnelly's focus, it, it, he's he, he can explain that. The, the, the repairs of the city and district. Our focus is on how we can improve the lives of people here, that we can deliver for people, that we can provide homes for people, and that we can deliver on the key strategic um, projects that we want that, that will ultimately improve this the economy of the wider Northwest region. So our focus going forward is improving the system. They have an, an enabling approach they ensure that we see delivery, that, that we see that we that we're not constantly stagnating and that we see this city and district delivering for people. That's and we will make no apologies for that. The contained within that report is the con continuous engagement with environmental lo lobby groups. Hundred percent, that's really important. Um and and, and I'm delayed and if and if it wasn't contained within that, those recommendations. We would be arguing that it was, but but the fact that it's contained within that reflects on all. And I know there's there's quite a lot of information contained in the report. If you were coming at this new, but this isn't new. This is something that's been discussed for years. Um, this has been discussed pre COVID. Pre COVID, there's been various reports brought to working groups, brought to committees, um, prior to COVID, um, and. And then, and following COVID, we had audit office reports. We had, uh, and we had, we had numerous meetings um, with these consultants, with council officers, and uh, and we all are interested parties. So there's, this has been the culmination of of a whole lot of work. There's recommendations there that are that are applicable to our council, the 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 planning committee itself, and. Implementing those changes could prove to prove to be challenging as well. But you expect you from from that from the perspective and from that fundamental principle to say that we need to try to do things differently, to achieve uh, better results for people of the city and district. That's the process that we're in. This proposal is asking that we wrap wrap up all the work that we've done and start again. Um, but just because. Two people decided that they didn't have confidence in the process and they weren't going to take part in it in the first place. Um, it's it's ludicrous. Um, so 
the, the, the independent report, we're, we're not proposing that we spend another tens, tens of thousands of pounds to redo this because we don't like the outcome. Um, we're, we're, we're accepting that this is the views that have been taken as part, uh, as, as part of that consultation process. Let's move forward around how we can implement those. Um, and if, if people don't feel that they can support that, that, that's on them. But from our perspective, we're, we want to be efficient forward. We want to improve the system and we're committed to do that. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Jackson, Councillor Anley, and Councillor Harkin. I'm going to let you back in, but everybody that's indicated to speak has already spoken on the proposal. So I'm going to ask you to be brief just so we can move forward. Yeah, that's okay. After, after such a rant, at which well, that's the first time he spoke on but, the proposal. But Terry went completely off the subject. For, I don't think yeah, so. And I have no bar, but I just want to at least give me no, a, you can, a chance you to. You can speak. Yeah. It. I'm but just, I, I'm I won't be able to, you. What I won't be able to do is answer everything he said because, you know, I would need, I'd need to rewatch. Well, I'm glad it's an open. Because I think people on the other day have exposed themselves by such rants, and and I will watch the recording and and come back at it. But this is this is as a maybe a mistake. This is not a Sinn Féin report. It's a Sinn Féin initiated report. Is that right? Is it? Yeah. And and so look, see regards to tens and hundreds of thousands. I don't know where where you're coming from there. The the one for the five thousand. Was one that you and every our councillor and other man on here agreed to. So why are you throwing it, throwing it back in people's face? It's a, it's a, it's a report that was carried out and brought on here. Uh, twenty fifteen. This is this is reminiscent of twenty fifteen, where when I sat on here and about the whole Sturden contract, where people said m more or less, shut up. Your your dreamers dreaming. I think was what the SDLP said. Uh, you're not on here about openness and transparency. And then after three reports, we eventually got to the bottom of it, and there was dozens. I think it might have been at least 60, 70 recommendations. Now, if people are in here saying this is the answer, they all are, or whatever, then time will tell. All I am asking is for a bit of feedback from the people who contributed to it. I didn't contribute it, and I have my reasons, but I'm trying not to be blinded by my personal reasons why I didn't, but realise that there's people out there who will come to me or who will vote for me, and I am trying to represent their their position. And all I am saying is saying, bring them in and listen to them. I'm not asking for anything tore up. I'm asking, let them have their say on the final report. It's not going to be the end of the world. Thank you. Councillor Herkin, go ahead, and then I'm going to take yeah, a vote on the proposal. I mean, I'm responding directly to Councillor Jackson. I, I talked about the report recommending that we encourage and develop and support an enabling culture rather than a regulatory culture. And I don't think that the reason why Ulster University hasn't invested in Derry at McGee uh, is because we haven't had an enabling culture. I don't think the fact that we don't have the roads and rail infrastructure that we need has anything to do with our council not encouraging an enabling culture. I don't think Invest I haven't invested in Derry in the Northwest because there's not an enabling culture here. And the list goes on and on and on. So that's just nonsense, to be quite honest, because they, they, that's got to do with sectarianism. That's got to do with the fact that after 25, 30 years of the Good Friday Agreement, um, there's still a mindset in Stormont that, doesn't, that actually has continued to disinvest in the Northwest and Derry. It's not got to do with an enabling culture that uh, that our planning committee or planning service uh, doesn't promote. So I think that, uh, I just think that that is wrong, that that is the wrong way to look at why we haven't had investment in the Derry. This is political, these are political decisions uh, and that Ulster University, that Stormont departments have made over and over again. And it's not got to do with us now having to say, we're open for business. We've been saying that for 60 years, and there hasn't been any investment in the way that it should have been done uh, in that period. So that's wrong. Look, there's things and the, there's recommendations that I don't support. So I am going to oppose those because I don't think it'll be good for Derry uh, and Strabane District. Um, and I'm going to try and find ways of actually, uh, that's why I'm supporting the proposal, because I think it gives uh, other people who will oppose the, those proposals and who will be confused by it and confused by 
the possible ways it gets interpreted, uh, opportunities to push back against it, because the recommendation here is that we implement the proposals and that we, that's what it says, it says that we um, implement them, uh, that we, uh, and, and move forward with the recommendations. So that's what we're here to do today, to sign off in this document that would be fully ratified at the full council. Um, so I don't support the idea that we should now develop uh, an enabling culture in the context of uh, residents around this district, uh, very angry and very concerned about HMO building and possible displacement of people out of areas. Uh, if you develop an enabling culture in that context or send the message out that you now have an enabling culture, what message does that send? What message does it send to residents? Uh, and that's what this is about for me. Um, so, I, 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 again, I wouldn't sign off on this today. Uh, I wouldn't sign off it off on, 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 the, con on the recommendations um, uh, full stop. And that's why I think we should actually, uh, we have to have more discussion on this because there, there's disagreement. Councillor Shane, I'm going to allow you your short question, but it needs to be short, please, before we move on to a vote. Thank you. It is very short, um, Chair. Um, Councillor Donnelly has talked about um, him, people who come to him or who vote for him, and him coming in here to represent them. Um, and that's his job. I would expect nothing less. Um, and they're going to be unhappy with this report. Contra Harkin says they're going to be confused. I think he's right. There are people confused, um, but I don't think it's people outside. Um, but I would just like to know, who are these people? Because from my reading of the report, only 112 people responded. 120, sorry, people responded. 26%, I think it was. I don't have the page right in front of me, Chair. 26% of those people didn't have confidence in the planning system. Across Darien Straban, a population of about 150,000. I work at it with 30 people. And according to Councillor Donnelly, they all live in the mirror. I find that really, really hard to believe. So all I'm asking, Chair, through you to the proposer, who are these people? What groups are they? Have they not been involved? Because everyone was involved. All groups were involved. Where, well, who are these people? What I'm not going to facilitate is a, a five-way conversation when we're going around in circles. I think people have made their views clear on where they stand on this proposal, and I think that it's the time for us to move to a vote on that. Um, if people Chair, want to ask the those questions, respect, with I respect, think that's a valid question. Well, I think if you proposal. can ask that to Councillor Donnelly directly. Um, I know he can respond in his own due course, but I want to move to a vote at this stage, please. Thank you. Chair, can I just say, look, I, I think that these kind of individual put downs about people being confused and this and that, I, I don't think you should be accepting that sort of stuff as chair. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so we'll take it to a vote. So Alderman Cook. Against. Alderman Wilkinson. Against. Councillor Donnelly. Councillor Farrell? Against. Councillor Harkin? For. Councillor Heaney? Nil. Councillor Jackson? Nil. Councillor McGinley? Nil. Councillor Mooney? Against. Councillor Farrell? Nil. And Councillor Tierney? Nine against and two for, so the proposal falls, which moves us back to the original recommendations that were within the report on the original report. Do we have any views or comments, proposals or recommendations based on that? Sorry, through you, Chair. Um, if members would think it would be um, helpful or useful at this stage, um, we could um, reconvene the planning working group again for final recommendation 
to the committee. If, if the, the recommendations that were presented today, um, you know, have come from the, the working group, but if members have concerns about some of the issues that are being presented in the report, um, then there is the option to reconvene the planning working group again. If members would think that would be um, useful. Thank you, Chair. Do you have any members of thoughts on that idea for me, man? No. Chair, yeah. through you, yeah. um, thank you. Um, I, I understand the, the, the thinking around another planning uh, working group meeting. I would just like a little bit of clarity around 5.2. Um, I don't know whether that requires a full meeting of the planning working group or whether that could be possibly, um, and I'm, 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 in a, 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 I'm not teaching my granny how to suck eggs, but maybe that could be an, 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 an addendum onto the report for full council um, and we could see it then and study it and, and make the, the full review or the full recommendations at full council or perhaps if you have the information at hand, I'm happy to hear it now, but whatever you think's best. But I just don't know if a full planning working group is a good idea. No. It's fine. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor. And if members are um, happy, we can bring a, a further addendum to the report before it goes to, to full council. So thank you. In light of that, I would like to propose that we defer mm -hmm. the decision. On this report, the full council to that addendum is available so that we can make recommendations in full. If I could have a seconder for that, please. I'll second it, Chair. And I'm just wondering when it goes to full council, will that be an open or confidential business? Well, at this stage, the report's an open business, so I, th I would imagine that would carry through. That would be the, the case. Yeah, be an open business. Councillor Jackson? Um, I know, I'm conscious that we don't have legal representation here, but. Um, 5.2 of the report and that addendum around, because mm -hmm. it's essentially a tendering um, exercise. You no, know, can that be done on open business? Without the benefit of my learned colleague, um, if it's been tendered, provided we don't give any confidential information in terms of their actual tender and so on, then the outcome of the tender can be an open business. Um, so we would need to, I would need to check all that and, and come back. So whatever we put in would have to be um, information that can be shared that is not confidential. So um, I, I would imagine that we can do it, provided we don't put in the, the amounts, et cetera. And I suppose the, I wouldn't want the fact that it's held in an open business to restrict the information that member because we want to take a decision that's informed. We want to be we want to be armed with as much information as we can before we take a decision. And particularly in relation to Sean, is key to that because because we we've always identified that. Through, through this process, the implementation part is going to be key. Um, and there, because we, the, the issues that, that have been raised has, have been well rehearsed. The report has almost just, um, has reflected a lot of the discussion that was taking place in the working groups. Um, so, but we've read right throughout all of this, as we said, for us to make the changes that are necessary to improve the system, to improve the services, and they they support um, our team within our planning system, um, we we need to get the implementation right, and um, I just wouldn't want to have a situation because there was a proposal to take the report on the open business that that would restrict information that's coming forward. So I would leave it open that if if there if if it's necessary for uh, in relation to five point two, if it's necessary for that to be in confidential, then um, then then it, it, we would support that. Thanks, chair. 
Sorry, if I just come back and clarify what we've done in, in the past with previous uh, confidential uh, information, such as this, like land transactions, we've put the decision into open. But but the confidential aspect in terms of the value has been in a confident has been in confidential. So members can all see the open and confidential issue. Of any members of the public can see the open what the rationale for the decision. But any confidential information is contained within the same meeting, but in the, uh, the confidential aspect of the meeting. So I would imagine in this circuit we can put a report in that says this is how we would report it. This is the tender and etc. But any confidential information in terms of the price and so on. Could be sitting in a separate report under confidential, which doesn't alter the decision and doesn't alter the transparency, but protects the individual from the, the that aspect. So that would allow the decision to go through as as you discussed. Thank you, Stephen. So I think at this point that we've agreed that we're going to defer it to full council pending that information being made available to members. I'm conscious of the time and I just want to get a view on it from yourselves. Just go straight through or do you want to take a comfort break? Keep going. Okay. So item 12 is open for information. It's the forward schedule of deputations to governance and strategic planning. Does anybody have any comments? Councillor Heaney, go ahead. Uh, it's not directly under the paper, but it's, <coughs> it's a related issue. Uh, the Shared Island Unit presented to Dublin City Council uh, last night, as far as you know. And I know we have now written twice asking for Shared Island Unit to come in and present to this committee. So I'm just wondering, has there been any reply or update since, since the last meeting? Yeah, through you, Chair, um, we have secured representation for the Shared Island Unit to come to uh, the Northwest Regional Development Group meeting, which has been, uh, I think it's the 22nd of this month. Uh, the head of the Shared Island Unit has agreed to come down following a request from the Northwest Regional Development Group. The further correspondence in relation to GSP, which I had corresponded with you, uh, it actually came from full council. Um, we haven't received anything back on that, but hopefully that's something that we can raise um, with the Assistant Secretary when she's here, Emer Dean, um, at, at, on the 22nd of April. Thank you. Any other comments in that report? Can I have a proposer to move on to confidential, please? Thank you. I'll just give it a wee second for us to move forward. Yeah. 